so hey everyone, uh, good morning, good afternoon. Um, I hope you're all doing well today. Um, I see some familiar names in the in the room. Thank you for joining today. Um, and uh, so Sarah was talking about Spotify and uh, you know the developer experience. And so I happen to be uh, you know in the developer experience team at Google in the Bay Area. Um, so I work as a staff technical writer. And I've been in the technical writing profession for uh, just over two decades now. And over the past few years, um, about 10 years to be precise, I've been doing some research into um, analytics and I've been practicing it at work, uh, basically to learn how analytics can help us understand our users better and how we as tech writers can use analytics to demonstrate the uh, business impact of the work that we do as um, tech writers. Um, so in the talk today, um, we're going to do a few things. We're, we're going to discuss how web analytics can help us as documentation professionals uh, to understand the key metrics, to look at the typical analytics process, and to interpret uh, metrics to get reliable insights into our users' needs and behaviors. Disclaimers first, the um, the views, the thoughts, the uh, ideas and the opinions that I'm going to share today are entirely my own, uh, based on my experience over the years. Uh, they might not necessarily reflect the views of my employer. Um, also, this talk is not about any specific analytics um, tools that different vendors like Adobe or Google will provide. Um, so it's kind of uh, tool agnostic. Um, session, if you will, essentially a compilation of best practices for uh, what you can do with analytics and, and some gotchas that you need to avoid. Um, I'd like to start with a quick look at how analytics can help uh, us as technical writers and documentation professionals. Um, so web analytics can help us learn who our users are, where they're from, um, how they use the information that we publish. And, and it's, it's a relatively low cost and um, you know, reasonably practical alternative to engaging live with our customers. Uh, some of the uh, suggestions that um, uh, Sarah was talking about, like interviewing customers and setting up live feedback channels and so on, those are awesome. But sometimes those can be expensive and web analytics can be a more cost effective alternative for that for developer engagement. Uh, analytics can help us um, uh, figure out which of our pages our users visit most often, how much time they spend reading our content, how they navigate our health system. Uh, we can also use this information to improve the quality of the decisions that we make when we plan, uh, write, and maintain documentation. But analytics cannot provide all the answers that we need. Uh, analytics, for example, cannot give us information about on user sentiment, for example. Uh, metrics will not help us understand our users' intents and their experiences when using our uh, content, at least not always. For example, if, if you're keen to understand what information a user was thinking about or what information they were looking for, um, you know, it's kind of difficult to connect the dots and find that answer through analytics. Uh, um, or were they satisfied or frustrated, right? The emotional aspect of uh, their experience. Did they uh, skip content or did they read through it carefully, right? The leader behavior and so on. These are uh, questions for which we might need to use other sources of feedback, like some of the ones that Sarah was talking about, like user ratings and comments. Uh, and even those sources might not help us fully understand user sentiment, but that's, that's uh, something we can talk about another day. Before we dive into analytics, I'd like to um, you know, um, pause and have us all take a look at this graphic. Uh, as you can tell, this is um, you know a kind of meaningless graph. It's it's showing an almost direct correlation between two phenomena that are not related in any way. Right. Uh, the, the point of this graph is that. Um, we and anyone else can manipulate data um, you know, so that it serves whatever agenda we want to push, right? So, and we see this being done in our 
uh, daily lives, um, you know, like uh, in the fields of business and government and politics, uh, environment and social welfare and so on. Um, so it's clear that data can be used to show something that's entirely fictional as the truth, right? Um, and so we all understand that correlation does not necessarily mean causation. So I'd like to keep, uh, I'd like us all to keep this pitfall in mind every time we set out to use analytics in our work. Um, but then what answers can analytics provide, right? So before we look at specific metrics, I want to make sure that we all fully understand the meaning of a few of the key metrics that analytics can provide. Uh, imagine for a moment that this figure is a website which has eight pages. In this example, A, B, C, E, and so on, with a home page that's uh, called G in this case. So let's say that uh, a user enters this website at page F and then moves through a few of the pages. And at one point, uh, the user returns to page F and then eventually leaves the website through page G. In other words, after going to page G, uh, the user closes the browser session or the user goes to a different website, right? So this is the development journey for uh, like one user, for example. Uh, another user uh, you know, enters the same website through another page, clicks through a few pages, and then leaves the website after uh, looking at page H, right? And so this is the second developer experience. And then the third user, uh, he enters a particular page E and then exits the website without any other page. So that's, this is a you know, fictional scenario that you know, I'd like to use to illustrate metrics. So let's see how the metrics for these three uh, scenarios are measured. So we'll start with page F. Um, so page F was viewed twice in uh, one session, right? You can see that here. Note that I mentioned view, right? Not visited. Uh, it was viewed once as the entry page and then a second time on the way out. Uh, but because both the views happen during the same session, only one visit is counted. Right, so it's also counted as an entry page, right? So those are the metrics that were captured for page M. Um, we can go and look at all the examples, but we don't have time. Let's look at one other example, like page E. Page E has one instance of all the metric types listed here, including something called a bounce. Um, so a bounce happens when a user uh, uh, enters a website through a page. Uh, and then exits the website directly from that same page, like in this case, without going to any other page during that visit. So the calculation so far seems fairly simple, but in real life, things get a lot more complicated, unfortunately. For example, if a user leaves our website and then returns to the website within a certain predefined uh, time period, then that second visit might actually not be counted as a separate visit. Also, if a user enters our website and stays in the site for more than a certain time, right, um, right, so it's a long visit, then the analytics tracker terminate the, the visit at the end of that predefined period. And so these limits, the visit limits and the timeout settings might seem arbitrary, but, um, and they might be different for each analytics tool that you use, right? Uh, Google or whatever, but these limits exist for a good reason. They make sure that the frequent exits and entrances, and also the delayed exits, they don't skew the visit-related metrics too much. We should also keep in mind that um, visit tracking is typically done using cookies that the analytics tool sends to users' browsers. Right. So for users who don't accept cookies or who delete cookies. The visit related metrics like visit count, visitor count, and time spent per visit are sometimes only partially uh, liable. Okay, so we now understand how analytics metrics are collected. Uh, how can we use this data? The analytics process has several steps. Uh, we don't have time today to discuss the details of every step, but let's go over all of them quickly. The first step is to define the problem. We all know 
uh, that a well-defined problem is half the job done. Uh, we set out the use analytics, we should find out the business problem that we're trying to solve. Um, and as analysts, we play a role that's similar to a doctor, right? Before a medical doctor, so before making a prescription, um, uh, doctors assess the symptoms and diagnose the problems, right? And only then they move on to the prescription part. Um, the next step is to get the required uh, data. Uh, the data from tools is not a trivial task, and it can take a lot of time. And so to you know what metrics are tracked, we need to have a solid understanding of how every metric is measured. And uh, we also need to make sure that the data we're going to analyze is for the correct time period and that it represents our um, you know, meaningful customer base. The next step is to prepare this data that we've got for an analysis. Um, any uh, raw data set, as you all know, is bound to have unique and different problems. And so to um, to avoid the garbage in and garbage out risk, we need to set aside some time to prepare the data for uh, analysis, right? So carefully scrub the data set for any data that's not directly relevant um, to the problem. Identify and fix any inconsistencies in the data. So for example, metrics might be missing for some periods or for some pages because the analytics server was down or because the instrumentation of the page was not set up correctly. Um, so we need to remove these inconsistencies. And at times we might need to aggregate uh, connected data. So for example, a page might be served through multiple URLs, the same content. And so we might need to aggregate the data for all of these related URL variants before we can start the analysis. The next step is to analyze, explore, and visualize the data. And there's really no fixed roadmap for this step in the analytics process. What we do would depend on our goal, our domain knowledge, and the quality of the data from the previous step. And, and this step can be a fascinating exercise. It can be an extremely frustrating rabbit hole. Um, or it can be uh, a very rewarding and hopeful exercise, or both, right? So just um, be aware of that. So the big caveat here is that if you, if, if we try hard enough, um, we can pretty much tease out literally any uh, any insight from any given data, right? So let's be very careful about going too far with uh, interpreting analytics metrics. And the final step in the process is to describe and diagnose user behavior, uh, prescribe changes to make the effect of these changes. Right? So descriptive analytics describe the key features of the given set of data. We look for answers to questions like, okay, what are the top five uh, popular pages in my site? In diagnostic analytics, we find out why the data is the way it is. So we seek answers to questions like, um, Pages that we think are very important are getting relatively low page views. Why is that, right? Is this even a problem, right? That's what diagnostic analytics is about. In prescriptive analytics, we indicate what we can or should do in the future uh, to get better results for the key metrics that our business cares about. And in analytics, we predict or project future events based on current and historical analytics data. So each time we examine analytics data, we might run into roadblocks at any point of the process. And sometimes we might need to uh, rephrase our steps, go back. Uh, and almost always in order to get meaningful insights, we should be prepared to invest considerable effort, be patient and be prepared for some errors that we can do the wrong thing. So I'll spend the next few minutes talking about some guidelines and best practices to help us interpret these metrics Meaningful. There's a lot of literature about how to use uh, metrics such as with this page views and, and so on, and on straight and so on. I'd like to share just a few tips and recommendations that are specific to our domain, which is technical documentation. Um, the first recommendation that I'd like to share is to validate the data that you have, right? So we should try and validate our findings and analysis with other data points, including qualitative data. Right. Let's not rely exclusively on just one metric for our analysis. The second broad recommendation is to avoid any kind of cross-page or cross-page comparisons if you can. It can be very tempting to compare metrics across two or more documentation sets, uh, but as far as possible, we should try to restrict any comparison to within a product area. 
Um, so each product is unique in terms of complexity, the audience, the market maturity, the customers, uh, its usability, and so on, right? And all of these factors affect how users consume the information that we publish. And when analyzing data, we should try and focus on trends and relative ranking and not um, and almost never on the absolute metrics for a given document or for this one trade. So let's take a look at this example. So during one particular point in time, a period of time, there were two pages A and B, right? So they were viewed approximately the same number of times. So the two pages appear to be equally popular, right? Uh, when we take a look at the trend over time, the same data uh, shows us something, uh, a somewhat different story. The views for page A are declining, and the views for page uh, B are increasing over time, right? Even though the overall for the broader field seems to be the same. Uh, so clearly, when we were looking at just the total number of page views, we did not get this insight. So there are a couple of other messages from this example uh, that I'd like to share. First, the, the metrics for page B in this example show us that we should definitely wait for metrics to mature and become meaningful. In other words, uh, we should avoid looking at metrics until the docs have been in the field out there for at least a few months, right? Or whatever field you define. And second uh, insight is that we should try and use visuals wherever possible to tease out the trends and stories. So clearly a graph, a line, a line graph with data would have showed us more readily the true nature of the differences in usage between these two examples uh, when compared with just looking at you know, a spreadsheet like this. Another um, best practice is to remember that offline usage uh, is not track. So for example, if we offer our users the option of downloading content, maybe from PDFs, uh, then many of our users might download the PDFs and look up the uh, downloaded page uh, file whenever they need help, right? And there's really no way to use web analytics to try to type content usage, offline usage. And we should keep in mind that users in some environments, um, like in government setting, they work within firewalled networks, which means they cannot access online content. So they are necessarily using content offline. Uh, another thing to remember is that secondhand usage is not tracked. So let's say a user has a problem with the product. The user calls the help desk or contacts a colleague or posts a question on a discussion forum. The person who answers the question might look at our content and provide it. So sometimes the person giving the answer can take our content, add some context to it, uh, and might even publish a blog, right? Uh, or they might copy and paste our content to a separate knowledge base that they maintain. So over time, as more users look for the same information, our users may end up referring more often to these blogs and these secondary or adaptive sources of information. And we, as publishers of content, would never know that some users benefited indirectly from our content. Right, so this is similar to the uh, issue uh, of circulation versus readership that we see in the newspaper publishing industry. Right, so let's not make the mistake of assuming that a page with low page views is not popular. Uh, interestingly, metrics also depend on the nature of content. Right? So how we organize and publish our content can have a significant effect on analytic metrics. So let's take a look at an example. Say we have two documents within the site. Uh, they're similar in terms of type and tag length. The first document has 50,000 views, and the second one has 1,000 views, 100,000 uh, page views. Right? It might seem from this data that the second document is more popular, but let's break down the metrics a bit. We see now that the first uh, document is divided into uh, two HTML pages and, and uh, with 25,000 page views each, and the second one has four pages uh, with 25. Page each. Assuming that both these documents have the same content coverage in terms of uh, what they discuss, it's clear from this example that the web analytics metrics can sometimes paint a misleading picture about how the documentation is used. In, in reality, uh, every page in this example had the same number of effective page views. Um, but because one of the documents was chunked more accurately, it appears to be uh, in a more popular, but that's, that's kind of misleading. And finally, we should always use analytics metrics as supplementary, and not as the only basis for decision making, and we should definitely consider 
uh, qualitative factors as well. Um, so analytics data can tell us how our users interact with the application, but uh, it might not tell us what our users really need or how they feel about the experience of consuming um, our information. So those were just a few general guidelines. I'd, I'd like to take a deeper look at some of the specific metrics like page views. So it's, it's clear that when we have uh, you know, good page views, we are all happy and it's a sign that our pages are popular. Uh, Though so we still cannot say for sure that our users were actually satisfied with the content. I want to focus here on how we treat pages that have relatively low page views. First of all, let's not jump to the conclusion that pages with low page views are not popular. There might be several reasons, reasons for uh, you know, low page views. Uh, so like I said in the previous slide, we should be taking a look at trends. Uh, we should be looking at the age of the page, right, and the relatively new page. Uh, might not be widely adopted or used yet. Another factor is the discoverability of the page. It might not be showing up in the top results because it's not optimized for search, for example. Uh, another factor is structural change, right? So let's say we redesign our directory structure for our site. Uh, we move some pages around, we remove some, and we rename some pages. The analytics reports might show multiple records for some pages, each of them with a very low page view count. So we need to manually clean up this data before we can start analysis and you know, making decisions. And also don't ignore uh, pages with low uh, views. We should be aware uh, some pages will show up in analytics reports. Uh, we should be checking whether these pages are actually instrumented for analytics. And also uh, they might be offline. Uh, they might be pages that they're offering as online, uh, offline PDFs, for example. Also consider the newness of the page, right? A page that's relatively new is bound to have low or zero page views. Uh, we'll move on quickly to bounce rates now. Um, so bounce, occur, this is probably one of the least mis, uh, least understood of uh, metrics, and it occurs when someone enters the site through a page and then leaves the website without viewing any other page in the website. So first of all, my advice is let's not panic uh, when we see a bounce rate that's very high. It's not a definitive signal of anything. Uh, a high bounce rate is definitely not a sign of failure. Um, so much of the textbook guidance regarding bounce rates is uh, is oriented towards e-commerce sites or marketing sites. In the online shopping world, uh, a high bounce is not a good thing. Uh, retailers don't want to see users leaving their sites. But for documentation, the bounce rate holds somewhat significant, uh, different signals, right? Uh, a high bounce rate, um, might mean that visitors actually found what they wanted, so they quickly left our website, uh, right? So on the other hand, a high bounce rate for a landing page or an orientation page might be uh, an indication of a problem. So remember also that if a user's session, a browser session times out, then that kind of an exit might be counted as a bounce. For example, a user enters a site uh, that closed the browser ever, uh, so the user's session times out, and then the exit would be counted as bounce. Uh, it's really not a bounce behavior. So given these caveats around bounce rates, uh, when we look at this metric, we should combine it with other metrics like time spent on page. So let's look at that metric now. This one is tricky as well. Uh, so does time, more time spent on a page mean that the content was useful or the content was difficult to understand or the user simply forgot to close the browser or something else? Let's look at a few examples. If a page is popular uh, and users are spending a lot of time on it, then maybe it has too much content, right? And perhaps if chunk at a level that's too high, so consider chunking the content at a more granular, smaller level so that content is, uh, that's very complex uh, can be simplified. If a page has high bounds and users are spending a lot of time, check whether uh, it's a content page or a landing page. If it's a landing page, then this combination of high bounce and high time spent could show that users are desperately looking for information. And so they're spending a lot of time, but they're not finding what they need. So, so they're leaving the website to find the answers elsewhere. If the page is a content page, not a landing page, then high bounce and high time spent could actually indicate that the users found what they needed, and so they left the site. But they probably have to digest a lot of information with, uh, before they found what they wanted, which is why 
or the time spent is high. So we should explore opportunities to improve the chunking of this kind of content or look for ways to make the content simpler. For a page that contains reference type uh, information, um, a shorter time spent on page, uh, you know, could be a good signal, right? It might indicate that users found what they need very quickly. And, and so, for example, they might have looked for the description of a specific API field for an example. They found that and then they moved on, right? But for a page that offers overview or conceptual information, long time spent on page might be a positive signal and it might indicate that users spent some time reading the page and possibly found what they need. Um, so when we look, think of the time spent metric, uh, a nuance of analytics that we should keep in mind is that Time spent is typically not calculated for the last page that the user visits before visiting the website. Uh, so that's because the analytics tool typically uh, does not record the time spent when users leave a, uh, a website. So look at this example. So um, then a group of 50 readers enter a website through a page. They spend 10 minutes on an average um, reading the page, presumably, and then they, they exit the site. Right. Um, so in this case, there were 50 views, uh, uh, 50 entries, and then uh, 500 minutes spent. Right. And there were 50 exits as well. Uh, another 50 users, they came to the same page from other pages on the site. Uh, they spent five minutes reading the page, each of them, and then they go on to other pages within the site. Uh, so there were 50 views, uh, there were 50 entries, there were zero exits because users did not leave the site. And they spend a total of 250 uh, minutes. Right? In this scenario, the average time spent on the page, we would think, would be calculated as uh, something. Uh, but actually, it's being it is it, it don't, the calculation only considers 250 minutes uh, and divides that by the total number of users, which turns out to be two and a half minutes. This means that only the time spent by the second set of readers, that is the readers who moved on to other pages, is considered for calculating the average time spent. In reality, the actual time spent on the uh, page, this page was seven and a half minutes, and that is uh, three times the, the, tool, the number that the, the tool reports. So if we have a page that intentionally leads readers to another website, uh, so for example, if we have a landing page, that lets users download a white paper from a third-party content delivery site, then this landing page might necessarily show a very low time spent and high bounce rate, right? which might be a little misleading. So now we've looked at some practical tips to help us understand metrics for documentation pages. Uh, I'd like to spend a few seconds talking about uh, setting targets for analytics uh, metrics. Uh, so are analytics targets useful? Right. So many companies, they do define and track what they call key performance indicators or KPIs for their content. And such targets make sense for some sites, for example, for content marketing sites, news sites, and online shopping portals. Uh, but for documentation sites, KPIs might, such KPIs might not make, make a lot of sense. Uh, we should use analytics instead to understand how our users consume the information that we deliver. And then we should use that understanding to make decisions about um, how we plan and prioritize and staff our project and use this data to solve specific uh, business problems. And if we decide to set targets uh, for analytics metrics, then we should definitely consider a couple of factors to make sure that we set uh, meaningful and measurable targets. And these factors um, you know, include the availability of reliable data that the output has a history and a culture of making decisions based on data or you know, uh, other factors and so on. So um, if nothing else, and, and from this talk, I'm hoping that you just take a, a sense of caution with you when you start on your, on your analytics journey. It's, it's a rewarding experience, but it can, can be a minefield if you don't really uh, look out for where you're stepping. Uh, so this brings me to nearly the end of my talk, and let's quickly recap what we covered. Uh, so we understood that data and reality can be very different. Uh, data analysis is difficult, it takes a lot of time and effort. Metrics might not give us all the answers to all the questions, right? So to make decisions, we need to use qualitative data, our judgment, our experience, our knowledge 
of the content, our knowledge of our users, um, and then we, our experience with directly engaging with them, like Sarah was talking about with the Spotify example. Uh, so we need to remember that we're trying to solve a business problem first, right? Analytics is merely a means to that end. And the deeper we, we analyze something, the, the more risk that we get sucked into what I call analysis paralysis, right? So uh, we need to be aware of that risk and keep our uh, business goals in insight at all times. Uh, and we should constantly remind ourselves that we should uh, be able to see both the forest and the trees wherever we are in our analytics journey. Analytics and metrics are a great resource uh, when we use them wisely. But let's not fall into the trap of using just analytics as the main source of uh, for measuring success as as uh, you know content professionals. Uh, so, if you're interested in learning more about analytics, I'd like to suggest a few interesting books. Um, uh, listed them on the slide here. The the second and the third one are, are still on my to do list. Uh, unfortunately. Uh, most of the analytics books out there, including these, uh, they focus mostly on analytics for marketing, content, and websites. But these authors do a great job of explaining complex concepts using simple and accessible language. And if you have other reading recommendations, uh, I'd love to add them to my list. Uh, please do share them. Uh, thank you all for your time today. And I hope uh, you found this session useful. I, I believe we have time now for some uh, questions. But in any case, I'd like to uh, stay engaged with you. And if you have questions um, after this session, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn. Thank you. Hope you learned.